Welcome to another episode of Stoke Meter. And I am completely amped to have my buddy here, Kevin Shelley. Kevin Shelley is the CEO and general manager of Overstock.com. How you doing, man? I'm great. How are you? Very well. Very, very well. And this was this was one of those ones on short notice, and it is a pleasant surprise uh, because, as you can well imagine, Kevin is an incredibly busy man. But uh, we do have some pretty fun history. Well, former, I'm I'm taking a break right now, so I'm writing a book. But yeah, you know, someone else is taking care of a lot of messes. Hey, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing, and I can't wait to can't wait to see your book. And one of the things that I've always appreciated about you is that you are a jack of all trades, man. Uh, you always have your hands in the, into something. It's been fantastic. It, it's funny because the first time I ever met you, you're kicking my butt in Ultimate Frisbee in Central Park in New York City. <laughs> he, he, he had this. Yeah. And, and you know what? He's a, he's a ringer, man. He looks like he's harmless until he starts throwing the Frisbee. And he had this one overhand like this. Absolutely destroyed yeah. us. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was... I, uh... Yeah, such a unique throw no one could block it they used to call me well everyone had a nickname they called me tron because <laughs> i'd throw that disc like a hawk coming out like this way and everyone else is doing forehands and backhands and everything else but i had this one unique throw that was just i could throw it so fast and so arcade so you know accurate and so far that just as long as someone could be a, a, a wide receiver, it was so deadly. <laughs> it was deadly, man. It was deadly. And it was it was those little games that got me to appreciate uh, uh, Kevin. But also, it's when I started finding out all the little things that uh, you were doing. How many companies had you started and then been a part of? over the course of the time that I've known you and every most every one of them has, has been successful, but what are some of the things that you you've had your hands in? Well, uh, when I was, was starting my education, my undergrad, I wanted, I don't know why it was, I was just always interested in entrepreneurs and uh, just watching programs. I joined clubs on campus and I ended up just writing a business plan and I started my first company while I was still in school. Um, I was switching from engineering, which I'd been, been doing mechanical engineering for quite a while and then switched over and got a BFA in design. And I, I, in, in my summer times, I would, I would work as a door-to-door -door salesperson um, I had never done that in my life, but someone in a, a chemistry class I had kind of got me by the scruff of my neck and said, you know, you got to come out and work with us this summer. So I took that and what I, what I found out was coming from a ranch where I was just so remote from anything, you know, with civilization, I, I didn't know a lot about different professions and I didn't know anything about sales but I ended up being uh, breaking all these records that the first time salesperson had never done before. And I made just a pile of money and I got to the point and that's, that's when I decided this to kind of like rethink my major and stuff and I could do anything I wanted and I really loved design. And so I, but I had this pile of cash and I bought a computer, uh, this really fast computer at the time. And I was going through learning all the programs for graphics and 3D imaging and 2D this. And I had this pile of cash and I just thought, well, I, I should find something. And I, saw, I read an ad in a paper about a guy that did uh, candy, uh, like, you know, those quarter machines that just have candy yeah. in them. And I, I bought 
50 of these things Holy um, cow. <laughs> and put them all around the, the campus and I would just go and collect the quarters on the weekends and make sure that it was stocked. And it was really just about location, 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 making sure that you put them in the right place and kept things fresh and all the time. And anyways, I learned a lot from that. It was pretty simple business. Um, you just had to have the capital to get those candy machines and then I'd go to like the equivalent of a Costco or something and buy it in bulk and do it it gave me that opportunity to uh to try a different business than the one the one I had been doing was which is consulting well I guess you could say an independent salesperson which you are your own business person they're not you're not a hiring they're not hiring you and I went to Canada and I figured out how to get these products over the border and no one had figured out how to do that before. And I went in with my team of six people, including my twin brother, and we broke every company record on the books, um, not just individually, but as an entire team. And um, I was facing going back and working on the ranch in New Mexico and I knew about how much I would be earning there, but I saw the stats on the first year salespeople for these organizations. And I said to my brother, I said, you know, we've never been mediocre at anything we've ever done, but look at what the median income is for first year people. And I said, I mean, they're making like seven grand. Okay. I don't think we would even make you know, five grand back on the ranch. So why don't we just give this a shot? And uh, we made three times that. Uh, we just crushed the records. And so in just three months, I made like $25,000. Uh, tuition at the time was only $5,000. So you could go to, you know, for a full year uh, on nothing. And I had all this stack money. So that's, that was one thing I did was I, I read a lot of books, I joined clubs, I took business, you know, kind of entrepreneurial club type uh, things. I, I, I had the, what do you call them, They're these speaking series. I read a lot of books that summer. I was really lucky that a fellow that came on to my team uh, was already into the power series by various salespeople through the mm -hmm. years. And you, do you know what I'm referring to? Like Zig yeah, Ziglar I've seen him around. I've never read him myself. Yeah, <laughs> Dale Carnegie. And oh yeah, such. sure, sure, sure. Yeah, huh? yeah. And uh, what's uh, I forget the name, but the guy right now that's the biggest motivational speaker in the world. The the big tall guy is like yeah, Tony Robbins. Tall and yeah. Tony Robbins. Yeah. So he had Tony Robbins tapes. I'd never even heard of Tony Robbins before. And I listened to those tapes and I just fell in love with them. And they were all about self-talk and how you uh, can program yourself to do, program yourself to align your psyche so that you're not working against yourself. And essentially, because this team was so engaged in learning and, and just gathering as much intelligence as you can to apply it to what you're doing, we just all succeeded. We all just kept ironing out and figuring out and competing with each other. And I had enjoyed that most of my life with my twin brother. Anytime I had anything to do, my twin was there to do it. So whether or not we competed in USTA tennis and the junior circuit or to whatever, we would just punish each other and just compete with each other nonstop. And so we did that that summer. We made so much money. And so I just came back and just started thinking about businesses. And I, and, um, I eventually knew I wanted to do uh, be an entrepreneur, but I figured I, I would need to get degrees and still work for someone and then kind of peel myself away and right. do my own thing. Now, of course, you know, you hear people doing you know, entrepreneurs all the time, even out of high school or something. Um, but so the candy mach business machine was the first one. I ended up selling all those candy machines to another student and explaining the business when I left for, for my internships in New York. And then 
and I started my my first business in New York after I, I won a national competition in design. And this was computer graphics. And I had been doing these images. I, I, I guess you would call them either special effects or or illustrations now that are just completely 3D models. They don't exist in reality, but they're just beyond reality. And I had com I had submitted uh, some of my better portfolio pieces in a contest that was started by Norman Rockwell oh. back years ago. Uh, he started a society of illustrators to bring attention to the who's who of the top upcoming illustrators in the country who are students and that was my bfa program was illustration and i had just went towards computers no one else was doing computers in that program but you had to choose your medium and some people did watercolor and painting you know just becoming a stylized artist like a norman rockwell but for me i wanted to explore the computer and that meant ex you know really uh, painting with light and I learned to draw with a mouse as good as anyone could draw with a Wacom tablet today. I, I didn't have a Wacom tablet at the time. Later on, I did. But I would sit there and draw with this little roller thing and just do these incredible pieces and do these 3D models and um, ended up being one of the finalists. And it was at that time, I did several internships in New York, including for HarperCollins Children's Division. And then uh, an art studio that worked with some very famous, uh, well, the king of pop art, Andy Warhol. Oh, they yeah. did all of his big prints, graphic yeah. design prints. And yeah. they wanted someone to take over the business. This guy was in his late 70s and wanted to retire. And... I was introduced to him by one of Andy Warhol's girlfriends who is now in her late 70s, 80s. Yeah. And she had come to campus here uh, in my undergrad yes. looking for someone to do computer imaging. And I, she found me because someone said, well, the kid on campus that even the teachers have him teaching their courses in computer graphics because he knows more than anyone. And I just self-taught. This guy, Kevin, is who you should be. So so he she met with me. We worked with her projects. And I ended up, you know, in New York. She lined up one of my internships. One of my professors lined up another one. And then I got a third one on my own with Disney working on Lion King and the the basically the the program <laughs> They have a, a book that they put together, Disney does, whenever they launch a new uh, property. And in this case, it was The Lion King. It was a big, thick encyclopedia. And if you were an artist anywhere in the world that was going to be making licensed you know, towels or T-shirts or whatever, you had to learn how to draw all the characters in a very specific way. And whether or not you did it spring, summer, winter, fall, it had to map exactly to the colors and patterns and... Oh, the branding that Disney uh, authorized. Otherwise, it's not authorized. Even down to the African prints. The, like, you can't just use any African print. These are the, the, <laughs> the Lion King African prints. Right. And so um, I started, I, I had to learn how to draw Simba and Timba and all these different animated characters. And then we had to go through, and I helped uh, our other artists maintain their licensing by complying with the standards in that. And that's, that was one of my internships. But um, long story short is I ended up getting an agent when I was in New York who I met at this, at this uh, awards banquet of the Society of Illustrators. And through my internships, I had gotten, I'd been sending my portfolio around on a, on a little disc called a SideQuest disc. Um, it basically had a floppy drive that held a thousand times more information. And I had sent it out there and people were so impressed by it that I had 40 job offers <laughs> within just the first six weeks of being in New York. And it was because of this agent who I met who I invited over to my, 
to my apartment. I had nothing in the apartment. This was this was actually out on the campus of Columbia University. Uh, well, I guess just across campus, but a lot of students from international uh, uh, locations come here and stay at this place called the International House. And it's like yeah. a giant mansion that the Rockefellers put up and there's several around the world. And that's where I was. And I, and I had this apartment with nothing in it, but some workout clothes and some <laughs> even going to church. I just had a few clothes. One, anyways, the whole apartment was one suitcase and uh, and boxes and boxes of computer. <laughs> I mean, it just stacked all around me. And she came and saw me and just like, oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like this. And I walked through all the computer and I had built the computer myself from scratch, even down to the chipsets. I had wow. ordered them. I had taken a Mac apart and redone the chipsets and everything. And uh, anyways, that's how, um, well, that's how I started. Like her, her, she convinced me to turn down all those job offers. I was like, well, I have 42 job offers. I mean, these are like some <laughs> of the top design firms in all of New York, you know? Mm -hmm. um, she goes, this is her idea. Turn down the job offers, open your own studio with me and make them all your clients. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's so, great. Yeah. So rather than take just one job out of 42 offers, make maybe, them all. I mean, just, yeah. just bring them all. Yeah. So um, now I'll have to wind back. When I was the TA over the, the 3D and 2D graphics lab on campus, um, I was a sophomore. There was no one who knew the computer softwares and the hardware and everything better than me. And I got the job as a sophomore. No one else even applied for the job. No one was interested in computer graphics back then. Wow. And because of that, when, when we strike up a partnership with Pixar and others, we started basically bringing in the, the types of skill sets that Pixar wanted for any of the graduates and making sure that we were complying with them so that they could come out of our program and go directly to Pixar, or if they wanted to, to Lucas, or to Boss Films, or any of the special effects digital domain. And in the process of my final year, before I went out to New York, um, they had come to us, various the Hollywood you know, special effects companies, and they were tackling some of the hardest graphics problems in the world. And it turned out that some of the research that I and others have been done, and I don't know if you knew this, but where I went to school in Provo uh, invented 3D graphics. The mathematics oh. for right. three-dimensional graphics expressed in the computer, there's two mathematical kernels, and one of them is completely owned by the university there. Wow. Okay, so that's why a lot of simulators and special effects and and everything comes out of this area. Huh. Uh, and that's why I decided to, to, to move into that, from engineering into that design program. Now they're all in the engineering. They've got a supercomputer to render all the 3D graphics and the animations and everything. And, and like for probably 15 of the last 20 years, uh, they've won the Emmy or the Oscar for student films in animation out of this program. So I helped start that when it was, we just barely got a million dollar, um, whatchamacallit, a, a grant from AT&T. And they, they let us buy whatever computers we want. We had some silicon graphics workstations and we had some um, uh, AT&T workstations and whatever, but the software loan was 60 grand at the time. And that was just for one software program. So you would get access to all of these super advanced computers and softwares. And, and I, I was one of the ones that tried to help figure out the flow for doing it. And because of that, we brought in some, um, we partnered to develop the special effects for Jurassic Park and then Titanic. And so we actually have uh, permission from those companies 
to that we're part of the Oscar winning series because those won Oscars. And yeah. Like that. <laughs> so before me and my brother and our people that I taught how to how to do 3D graphics, um, this little team of ours had already won two Oscars before I even arrived in New York City um, for these things. So. It was quite interesting to transfer and try to build a studio rather than going out to the West Coast, but to go to the East Coast where you just don't hear of those types of companies. Right. But they were starting, like the company that you know of called Big Sky that does yep. um, the animation like Ice Age. Yes. That's in, yes. That's in upper upstate New York in Rye, in, like Rye, Connecticut, or yeah, just outside of New York City. So I would go up on weekends and visit with those, those folks that were doing that, start my own studio, and little by little, I built it up in between working for everyone, all these other studios, the best basically art directors and creative directors that I could get my hands on. And within uh, a, oh, probably a year and a half, two years, my brother and I had split up. I had started a studio in New York. He had started one out in Marin County, uh, which is just north of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was pulling in the jobs from that kind of client, which would be special effects. And I was pulling in advertisers. So we would be doing the Ford commercial, some special effects sequence of a car dancing and no. something like this. Um, well, and, I, and about... About five years, I think it took for us to finally put it full time. And uh, so the next story I want to tell you is how, uh, as we tried to fundraise for this, because we needed studio space and New York's very expensive and we needed computers and all this stuff. I had reached out to my brother who had been going to these various conferences. And when we figured out a new graphics 3D algorithm that would work better at a morph sequence than anything else. Like for instance, the morph sequence for Michael Jackson when he does black and white and his face yes. morphs yep. from a male to a female to an yes. African to a whatever. We did that sequence. That is one of our signature uh, mathematics solutions. You're, that you're, never you're been blowing done my before. mind. It wasn't a video dissolve. It wasn't a video dissolve you know, with just pixels. It was literally vector graphics that were, that the, that a, a, basically a, a 3D model that we shrunk wrapped to the, to the laser scan of Michael Jackson and others that, that came into the studio and, and we did these laser scans of them. So we got their topology, but then we vacuum formed a 3D object around them and that gave it perfect number of, of, uh, the same number of facets in the geometry. So that if you wanted to morph, a nose would become a nose, ears would become ears, they would stay. Otherwise, with an uneven number of polygons, you could have a morph where the morph starts going into the ear or the <laughs> yeah. chin rather than nose to nose with the right ana anatomy. And so that was one of the things that um, my brother and our team and everyone that was working in this field was coming up with. Um, by the time I started my own studio, uh, we had uh, been giving white papers at some of the top scientific uh, conferences in the world on 3D graphics. And we'd do a white paper, we'd describe how we did something, and then everyone else would kind of figure out what we did and duplicate it. Um, and so we wanted to move into software rather than just sharing the idea like mm -hmm. academia would do. We wanted to not always be in the service industry where you get a job, you do the job, you sleepless nights, waiting for that thing to render for three weeks, get it out on time, and then get to the next one. And service industries, you don't make very much money doing that, but if you have software, you can make money while you slept. And right. people would just license this little plug-in that would go into these software programs, and then they'd pay you, you know, $1,000 for a license of that, of that little thing. And we thought that would be a, that obviously was a much better business plan. So, so I ended up um, uh, working with my twin brother to bring in some investors to help us do that. And, and we ended up 
joining forces with two other companies and built the largest special effects studio in New York. Um, so I would say that would be my second New York business. First one was a studio under our own name. The next one, we changed the name and got together with some other uh, specialists in various areas and started developing software. And the software that we created is is a kind of a predecessor. We were working in tandem with what you now call as MPEG-4. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the codec, the compression standard that goes from when you send something over the internet and it's a rich media like video, audio, things like that. We had done MPEG-1, MPEG-2, MP3s. Right. And now we were thinking of a different way of compressing all that so that it wouldn't just be specific to one type of data, audio versus video versus data, but there were seven kinds of data and we wanted a codec that would hot swap. It would snoop out the entire pipeline between the person requesting it, what their device was, what their browser was, what's all this stuff and find out all the metrics in between and then send them a stream of data that would come in like little seeds and grow like a garden on their graphics card. Right. And you wouldn't have to be downloading just video, which was really fat at the time and couldn't be done over a, a, a modem, like a 24 baud modem or something right. like that. And um, we came back uh, to, we had filed something like 23 patents in this. And I came back to my alma mater where I did 3D graphics at Brigham University and the School of Engineering and Education had been following our kind of rise to notoriety in this, in this <laughs> area. Bet. And we were, we were like a keynote speaker in the De Jong concert hall, just packed full of engineering students, animation, communication students. And um, New York was just kind of a whirlwind for me. I started that business. We we wanted to raise five million. We were offered fifty million. Uh, we ended up raising around twenty-three million in three different rounds. And um, I don't know if you ever came, but at one point during frisbee and stuff, you know, on weekends, um, there's two things I would do. And I, I was, the rest of the time, I was just working nonstop. I was like Steve Jobs or someone. I just I had no time other than just weekends, a little bit of Frisbee, a little bit of that. But the rest of the time, I was just constantly on the go, uh, setting up um, bases in different countries, getting uh, agents that would feed the, our pipeline business, and then coming back and doing it. I was wearing a lot of hats, and I finally became just chief creative officer rather than the CEO of the business so I could focus on on the fun stuff again because I was just getting so burned out with the business side of it. Um, next thing happened was September 11th. Uh, we were just doing another round of financing where uh, we, had, we had had the top VCs out of uh, uh, Intel, so uh, Intel uh, VC arm had invested in us. Um, others out of uh, what do you call it? Silicon Valley, and then as far away as China and different places, uh, Bell Star Capital and Bay Star Capital and stuff. These were kind of the sequoias of today yes. back then, just like the top top uh, ones. Um, and anyways. Uh, we were going to go through our next round of financing uh, and we needed a bridge loan because September 11th happened. The, the dot-com fallout had happened before that and the Enron debacle and all that. And it was really hard to find capital. Uh, in fact, once we bought a business and we gave them, they had $2 million in capital in the well of cash in the in their bank account we bought their business for something like 200,000 shares of our business oh man right man simply because their board of directors saw where we were going with our technology and said these guys will be a thousand times bigger than you so even though they had two million dollars uh in the bank 
they ended up getting like a million dollars of our stock. Right. And we got $2 million of theirs because we were just growing so fast. They just knew that that would be worth 10 times that. So it's really an interesting thing to go through the process of that type of acquisition and see something that you would never think of, that you can buy another business with $2 million in cash or a million dollars of your own, right? <laughs> just create your own cash, call it stock and buy another company that's worth $2 million cash in hand and they would sell it to you right. because they wanted to be, they, they, they'd see the trajectory. So there are a lot of interesting things that happen like that. And, um, but eventually uh, we, uh, that business as promising as it was failed miserably because we could not raise any more money. We were looking for these alternative sources to keep us going. But at the end of the day, we couldn't raise a million dollars after September 11th. The market just, just Crap, got completely, yeah. it just collapsed. Yep. And it was like going through some kind of, uh, yeah, like a stock market crash. You know, yeah. it, it was like, it was, and it was really sad and I was really heartbroken about it, but I had to move on. Uh, otherwise that software would be sitting on the shelf and you'd be using it like you do Photoshop. <laughs> Only it would be a server player and authoring suite that just does MPEG-4. Uh -huh. um, but you do that still because MPEG-4 relies, but there wasn't one software that did it all. We were the first ones to do it. And um, when we tested the efficiency of doing multimedia that way over the internet, you would basically go to an IBM Prime certification. IBM would give you a computer that had standard software a server technology and you would count how many streams could you go before it crashed and how much bandwidth would you be swallowing until it crashed now you may remember a company called real uh media networks it used to be yeah, like a yeah, mp3 yeah. player yep and at the same time apple um, what was apple's apple's quick time they had various competitors Microsoft Media Player was a thing. Our technology, without any optimization, just our very first test was 16 times more powerful than real networks. And real networks has just been acquired. I think we did, did a, a public offering, one of the two, for half a billion dollars. So if, we, so if they were worth half a billion, we're 16 times more, uh, it was, it was insane. <laughs> yeah. It, it was like, it was crazy. So, um, but it was sad to see that go. And, and anyways, I was just kind of traveling and trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And, and I ended up reading an article while I was traveling in American Express used to have with your card, if you had like a black card or a diamond card yep. that would give you this catalog and you could buy whatever you want in it. You just earn points, like travel points or whatever. And they had this uh, offer in there that said, buy anything in the catalog and we'll give you two round trip airfares on your next certificate, on your next travel vacation. We'll, the, the airfares are on us. And I looked around that catalog and I, but man, there's a watch in here for 150 bucks. How can they be giving like $600 <laughs> of airfares for $150? And I thought, wow, that's crazy. It's like, okay, I, I, I couldn't sleep after that. I was like, okay, I understand how I bought a company for $2 million with a million dollars, but I don't get this. This doesn't add up. So I ended up trying to I, I read into it and I looked at, into the legal description of it and stuff and it turned out that I, I thought it was American Express I thought they were the largest travel agency in the world and they've got perks and if they want to give away something they're going to earn it back in the long run and that wasn't the case they weren't even the one running their own travel certificate they had a third party that had come up with the idea and was doing it for them so I called that company up they were down in Florida and I said okay I don't know what's going on here because I'm very curious about how this is working. It makes no sense that you can do that. And um, I found out 
that how they were doing it and it was really really smart clever but in explaining how they did it they didn't do it digitally uh if once you got your certificate but you know it arrived in the mail and you'd open it up and it's like a book and it have all this <laughs> all these different vacations you could go on and which hotels you'd have to stay to qualify and you bought the hotel and with it there would come two round trip airfares with it and um it was partly arbitrage partly breakage partly a lot of different business principles uh that were allowing it to happen but they had shaved down the margins where they could do this and they were making money just selling the certificate to the businesses um so American Express would say, okay, we'll pay you $20 for each certificate that you do, okay? And uh, they'd do like half a million certificates in, during a campaign, an ad campaign, to get people to buy more product out of that catalog. So I ran my own algorithms to figure out what I could do, and I found out I could do it for a tenth of the cost of them. And I was like, well, what's my business model then? Do I just go there and say, hey, I'd like to uh, you know, sell you some software that I could develop based on the web that will allow people to do all of this online? Um, and I thought, nah, I don't want to do that. I want to say, I want you guys to do this one piece, but I want to, to do this digitally, and I want to go to my clients in New York I'm going to use your certificate, but you're not going to have to deal with paper. You're just going to log in your, your telephone people rather than waiting for something in the mail to come and then calling them back and doing all these manual tasks. This is all just going to happen over the computer. And they went for it. So I was like, all right. So I went and built, I did all this coding. Um, some of it I didn't know how to do myself. So I hired uh, two people, one to do a lot more of the front end and another one to do the back end. And uh, when about, I'd say about three months went by, um, I started landing these clients with, with, with the whole idea. I did some kind of, I wouldn't say freebies, but I, I just on, on, a, on a very thin budget. And these were nonprofits like FOP. Um, and then I worked my way up to uh, eventually get to Comcast. Was my idea is I don't want to mess up with Comcast, but let me just work my way towards a client of that size. And I, I basically showed them a certificate that I had printed out on a color copy machine and laminated and said, imagine this is your customer or this is your employee and you want to incentivize them to do something that you want to reward because it's going to make you more money and you're going to give me just a tiny portion of those profits up front so that you can enjoy the rest after that. And um, they could not believe the stats that I had done for FOP because normally if FOP was calling you up and saying, Hey, uh, this is fraternal order of police. <laughs> Would you mind giving a $20 or $10 donation just to help, you know, the police officers league or whatever. And they run things like baseball camps or whatever, different things that they do. And I, and I, and I went to FOP and I said, you're not going to use that dialogue and you're asking for too much. Uh, you'd have someone all day. She might close 10, ten dollar donations out of an entire day this is hundreds of phone calls right i said i want you to ask for a hundred dollars not not ten and i don't want you to ask for anything else a hundred dollars and i want you to tell them that if they will give you the hundred dollars it that they will receive a certificate worth two round trip airfares on their next vacation okay <laughs> and you'll show them a list of all the resorts that you can go to and these are all the locations so you can't just pick anywhere but you can pick from 70 places that you can go we will pick up those airfares they were closing hundreds of hundred dollar donations a day <laughs> after that exactly. right not 10 literally i mean it was like taking candy from a baby and um so anyways that worked out really well there was a portal that you'd go to you'd you would put in the code on the certificate it was encrypted and i did all this other stuff 
And that was my, my second business. Um, well, I mean, I guess third in New York City. And, uh, and I did it just because something nagging me when I'm reading an American expressing that doesn't make sense to me. And knowing that I want to do something that I could keep small, no bigger than a two-person team or whatever, and grow that to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And so that was my second business, and it was called Escapod Corporation. Um, and at that time, we just thought, oh, we can start with airfares. But after that, man, rather than just saying, oh, I'm going to give you this. Uh, you ever do Boy Scouts where you did these these uh those oramas where you would go and buy tickets and if you sold so many you could get like a little camp stove oh or yeah and then you looked in the <laughs> then you looked in the catalog like 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 <laughs> Sears and found that that camp stove was worth two dollars and fifty cents but you were raising three hundred dollars in order to, <laughs> to qualify for that well it was that kind of thing is that most incentives that are out there on the market have a really hard time having an emotional response like you really want them but the air first certificates were like off the charts in fact with comcast they were used to getting a 1.5 to 3 percent ror return rate of return on their advertising wow. um the first the first promo that we did with them with these travel certificates 10 times that 33% return. They convinced 33% of people on cable to switch over to Comcast. Wow. And it only cost Comcast $19 per certificate. That's the cost of the first month of a subscription. And every subscription after that is completely profit to them. It cost them $19 to convert that person wow. with our certificate. Wow. Nothing else worked like that. So that was what I did. Then I, I was, a lot of the things I get into are just kind of things that come to me. Um, I keep a <laughs> list of them, but I can't go after all of them. And I ended up just focusing on the next one. The next thing that happened was I wanted to take a break and I got an invitation to go on Columbia University and hear a lecture by a fellow. And by the end of that lecture, it changed my life. I, it was like, I don't know, it was like receiving a calling or something like Paul or something on the road to Damascus or whatever. Or Paul, <laughs> I wasn't a sinner. I wasn't killing anybody, but I was killing myself. <laughs> and, and I, anyways, the, the thing that, what, who he was, was um, I went up to him afterwards. I said, I have never been more moved by any, any lecture I've ever meant to. I've never heard of what you did. I'm blown away. Um, I do this and this and this and this, and I'd love to take a break and just come and work with you. And two years later, he won the Nobel Prize. Wait, His wow. name is Muhammad Yunus, and he's the father of microfinance. Yes. So he's the father of microloans. Oh, right? my goodness. Yes. And uh, so just all this happened to just happen to go to this lecture that was so moving to me. And one of the things that they were trying to tackle was there were all these microcredit institutions all over the world, but there was no way of rating them. And they were growing by leaps and bounds. At that time, they'd done about 80 million loans to people below the poverty line or below $3 a day or something. I mean, it was really, really poor. And um, I flew around and developed systems and programs and stuff. And I, I got sponsored by um, my, a mutual friend of ours who was working for National Geographic at the time. I went to them and said, you know, this is uh, something I'd like to get into education, uh, into schools and stuff. And the idea is I want a child to be able to, in a classroom setting, go to a little laptop or whatever and be able to pull resources, 50 cents, a dollar, two dollars. I want them to be able to make a donation to a group called Kiva, uh, Kiva.org over in, in um, uh, San Francisco. And I want, Kiva's gonna take and give that to a tiny little village somewhere in Africa to someone who has never had education, medicine, 
uh, a job or anything. No one's there to hire them. And they're going to become their own entrepreneur and we're going to fund their, their business and you're going to get to watch it grow and they're going to get feedback from that. And once um, Kiva or one of the other partners is going to issue that loan, um, eventually you're going to get paid back your principal. You won't yep. make anything, but you will learn all about the process and geography and humanitarian work and, and what causes poverty. It's a very complex thing. It's not just lack of money. It's, it's, it's a lack of infrastructure, lack of education, lack of health. There are a lot of things that keep people chronically poor in the world. Um, you can't say the same here in the United States because we have so many other things that are there, but, but elsewhere they don't have that. And so I worked in that area for four years. Um, I was there uh, the day after uh, Muhammad won the Nobel Prize. He met with me and others in the group um, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It was the World Summit for Microcredit, and uh, we just did all kinds of technologies, even figuring out how to uh, make a bank on a cell phone. And this isn't a smartphone. This is only text messaging, <laughs> just via text message, how to send money via text message. Right. And um, anyways, yeah. Um, and this is a long time. This is before PayPal. This is before anything, sending message through a text message type thing. So um, anyways, I worked on that area and then I came back and uh, to the States and the same fellow who you and I both know uh, uh, had moved on from National Geographic. He'd been working at Sports Illustrated and National Geographic and he was convinced to leave that and do a startup with a partner of his that wanted to do a mobile marketing platform and this is a way this is before smartphones but a way to receive a coupon via text and a way to search for it so basically imagine this I, I pick up my phone and rather than having to open an app or access an internet or anything this all worked on sms this is just straight off the cell tower you don't have to have anything and it works in an instant and all you do is put two words in uh pizza if you want to search for a coupon on pizza space and the zip code so you don't have to have gps because you know your zip code so you just say pizza space pizza, uh, pizza space zip, co uh, zip code center it in and within three seconds ding 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 ding, ding four five six different coupons in that zip code would be showing you oh, a little man. 25 character synopsis of it and they'd have a number in front and you would just hit reply and hit the number of the one that you like the most, say buy one, get one free versus 30% off. You'd click number one, at buy one, get one free, just hit one return. And then would send you more, more description, the address and the location and a little code. And you would just show it on your phone and you got the, you got the coupon. Oh my gosh. What we had done is we've gone and signed up all of these businesses around college campuses. Um, they were sitting in our database. And when you queried the keywords that we had entered in, we'd help the business do this behind the scenes. And it would come in instantly and you would just show that and they could gather all the analytics how many people responded to this ad versus that one so they could a b test all day long and only cost them like 60 bucks a month and versus if you go to columbia university today see how the barber shop or the oh, yeah. the movie place or pizza places are advertising they're giving you right xerox copies yes yes okay, calculate yeah. how many they go through about five thousand dollars 5,000 of these a day can be handed out. That wow. ends up being hundreds of dollars a day. Okay, yeah. day after day after day after day. And your rate of return is one in 200. Oh my gosh. So you hand out 200 of these to people who are not asking for pizza, not asking for a haircut. Your rate of return is one in 200. What we were doing was they they were telling us what we wanted. We weren't pushing anything. Right. They were just saying, I want a I want a pizza. I wanted this. We were getting in some cases between thirty percent return rate of return to a hundred percent. 
Like every person, in some cases, 100% of the people that we've got the coupon used it. Wow. That's, that's killer. Yeah. For a business, that's killer. Oh. So that was my fourth business that I did. And um, that was, that's actually what, what made me left New York was I came out because they were, they were struggling and we had to end up selling that business um, to a, a company out here, a big media conglomerate. I wanted to sell it to Comcast because <laughs> I had those connections. Right. But the other people in the board and investors um, wanted to sell it to someone else. And that transaction went through and uh, they wanted me to stay on as a head of uh, like a business development or something. And I thought, well, these guys are so small. They're probably not going to be like a Comcast and go nation, national. What I would like to do is continue doing business development because that's the role I played during the whole launch right. was figuring out how to mastermind to get the businesses on board and to grow that thing like a hockey stick. And uh, we went from before I came in and invested my time and my talents and brought it in, they'd sit there for six months and they didn't get more than five businesses to sign up. Right. From the time I took over everything, every aspect of that and said, this is how we're going to do it. We went from those three businesses that weren't even paying their subscription after a while, they just, you know, died <laughs> out to having over 6,000 businesses. And just Holy moly. 6,000. <laughs> $6, and, 60, and $60 a month was the bare minimum. You could do more, but that's what we were doing. And so that was just a cash cow. Um, wow. And so uh, that was how I got into mobile uh, phone technologies uh, right. because at that time apps were starting to come out. But this was before smartphones, and it was faster and more elegant than, than Groupon is today. Like wow. you didn't have to have wow. Groupon started out. You had to be on the website. You had to enter a profile. You had to um, have an internet connection and you had to have all these graphics. What I did was a, kind of a neural network. And it was just, all it did was learn from what you kept asking for it. It would figure out your sex by what you asked. I'd have to ask for your sex. I could find out what your sex was. If you asked for a nail salon three times, Okay, I know that you're very likely, you know, female, not male, um, or at least inclined that way. Um, I, I knew your age based on the types of things. I mean, there's just all kinds of data that we could, that we could uh, get without having to go through a, a lengthy profile, not, without, not having to have graphics either on the computer or on the phone, and not having to have a GPS and all that. It was just super... Yeah super fast, super elegant, super smart. And it got smarter over time. And wow. I learned a ton about neural networks with that project. So then the next thing, so now I find myself back in Utah and I'm thinking maybe I just go back to New York. Um, but after a year of, of doing business development uh, for this group, and, uh, and I'd already exited, right? They'd already sold the business. I just wanted to see it grow much faster than what it had, than what it had before we sold it. So I ran into one of my roommates from New York. He was living in Park City and he wanted, uh, we, we reconnected. I don't think it was over Facebook. I think it's just like, we just knew that each other was in town. And I knew his parents lived down down south a little bit so um so we reconnected and he learned about what i'd done since we were roommates in new york and he said i want you to be the chief marketing officer for a new business that i'm gonna fund and we're gonna go after the chocolate market and everything i'd done up to that point had patents this was going to be a trade secret we were not going to publish like the coca-cola recipe just don't publish right. it you don't yeah. have just 20 years of protection. You have the whole <laughs> life for, for it. And what, what he had figured out was that there were protein bars and protein shakes and all this stuff, but they tasted terrible. And they had a very yeah. bad aftertaste. And uh, you would, if you were male and you want to bulk up, you would 
okay, you would you would eat rat poison if that if that would help. <laughs> but women wouldn't. Women wouldn't touch. Women wouldn't touch a bad tasting granola bar or whatever to save their life. And so you had Luna bars and others trying to do yeah. that. But if you looked at the sugar content or the fat oh, content, it's, it's like a candy bar. Yeah. yeah. In fact, if you looked at any of them, they were like candy bars. Yes. Like, okay, yeah, you got some peanuts, you got some nutrition there, but okay. You are still right up there with candy bars. This recipe allowed us to cram in five little bonbons, little little balls about this big, little five pack, that was 40% of your daily need of protein and it had no sugar and no fat and it tasted like a gourmet chocolate. Oh no, they were delicious. Like right out of a C's candy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were delicious. You gave me a sample. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. All right. So... I was, so it's funny is that I'd done all this tech and everything, but when I landed in New York, uh, I was still single, um, in my late thirties by this point, I'd done six, six startups so far. Um, and everyone in my circle of friends knew me as the chocolate guy. <laughs> so funny. They knew nothing about special effects. They knew nothing about you know, freaking Oscars for Jurassic Park or anything. <laughs> it was just the chocolate guy. It was, it was like I, I had, I experienced this like strange, you know, out of body experience. Every time I'd meet with someone and uh, I just had camps of friends that had never met other friends in these different uh, right. things that I had done. So it was kind of funny. So anyways, uh, we took that to market um, and uh, we went to trade shows and everything. I did Hollywood parties at the these after parties for the Oscars and stuff, because I had a lot of contacts out there uh, yeah. from having done special effects and everything. And and um, anyways, that was a really fun period. Uh, I this was one of the things that happened with this business. Uh, unlike the other ones, that there was an exit strategy or something like that. Um, one day. Uh, I got a phone call. Uh, we had just closed a deal with Harmons and uh, Whole Foods and Nature's something, all these natural food stores and everything, because this thing was just off the charts. Um, and no one had ever seen it. And it is really appealing to women. Um, and anyways, I got a phone call from, you know, that friend of mine uh, living in Park City who says, wow, we're going to have to shut down. And I don't know when we'll be able to open up. I was like, what are you talking about? I just well, well, signed all these contracts and everything. And we, we just did a, we were just on television. The local news got oh, man. all this stuff. And here I am smiling ear to ear. We're seeing like, the, the, we're about ready to hit hockey stick, you know, for this business. And he pulls the rug out like that. I was like, dude, what happened? He says, well, one of our main secret ingredients uh, just tripled in cost. Oh, and man. there was an outbreak in, uh, in bovine, there's a bovine mastitis breakout in China and oh. they wiped out the entire herd. They had to kill cattle in the millions, tens of millions, because oh. no one would touch any product that came from that. And ours was being sourced. It's, 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 there's an animal Thing, secret something in there and we didn't have future contracts and if you if you uh if you don't have a futures contract saying you're going to buy at a certain rate this ingredient to oversee the fluctuations right so if you had a futures contract you'd be nailed in well it went through the roof and our bonbon box was already like 450 right. we weren't going to be able to charge 20 dollars, you know for right. four chocolates yeah yeah. So uh, we shut down and I didn't know how long um, that would last, but having gone through that before with the technology, the, the software that did MPEG-4 and stuff, we, I had no idea when funding would ever come through or in this case, when um, it would go, I had to find something else to do. You know, I just had to move on. And uh, that's when I ran, I, I, I went... I had started consulting with the governor's office of economic development 
on trade missions, helping businesses in the state of Utah go out to different countries and and close deals, actually get their products overseas right. in markets that they weren't in. So you've done as much as you can here. There's other business, there's other places to go. And so I was on one of the trade, I was one of the trade delegates and I would go and work with the governor's office. And then I was an advisor to the governor's office. And I was doing this on my on the side. And in the process, I got to know all the universities because one of the things we did in my committee was kind of like a shark tank. We'd invite <laughs> the entrepreneurs in on a quarterly basis and we'd go through their businesses. We'd go through about, well, there'd be maybe hundreds that would apply and we'd narrow it down beforehand to maybe 30. And we'd go through all 30 in one day. And at the end of the day, we'd give out about two and a half to three million dollars in grants. Oh, damn. If you were building a business and you and you licensed a, a patent from a university in the state, and you wanted to build jobs in the state, we would do like a matching funds type thing where we'll give you you know thirty thousand or three hundred thousand or whatever. You get matching funds, and and because it's good for the state, it's good for jobs, good for a tax base, right? Um, and so I got to know the ecosystem, and, and you would think that every state can grow any kind of business. It's just not true. There are some businesses that work really well. Like if you're, if you're going to design a textile, if you've invented the next Gore-Tex, you're not going to manufacture that here. You're going to manufacture it. If, if, if it's cotton-based, that business is going to be down like in the Carolinas or in Virginia. That's where the right. cotton belt is. Or it's going to be in China, but it ain't going to be here. Yeah. Or – um, you know, they, they just that's that's where the industry is, and so I learned uh, a ton about being in the governor's office. And then um, I I went to some universities here, and I got a list of the technologies that they. It's called a TCIP. It's it's a transfer from, and when a university professor comes up with some idea, they they are not the ones who own it, right? They're paying the salary. It's owned by the university. It's the university's department that just does nothing but try to monetize those things. And they try to find the right, they pair it with the right entrepreneur team that's interested and has the contacts. And, and I went through that list and there's a lot of interesting things on it, but the one that caught my attention was a biological. It was basically a very powerful germ killer that had, been discovered and no one had known about it before and and my brother my twin brother had studied medical microbiology it's funny <laughs> i studied 3d graphics and engineering he studied medical microbiology the whole reason why we did jurassic park and everything because he knew everything about anatomy and i knew everything <laughs> about computers and so we put this in this case i came to him and says what i'm reading here uh we had a lot of clients in new york that were drug companies in fact my brother after we did the first startup together and the second one in new york went off and did his own he started a marketing company and all they did was drugs and and pharmaceutical stuff and then he became the chief marketing officer at um at the hospital Cor cornell and columbia are part of a pre new york presbyterian hospitals and he was right. the chief marketing officer of that of that whole group outreach and things and so whenever I had something like this come up, I was like, okay, well, Devin's going to be able to read through this better than me. So sure enough, he goes, we got to get that. <laughs> you better get that one, not those other ones that you see on that list. Because I agree with you. He agreed with me. That is killer. Well, so I found out that they had licensed the technology a couple years earlier, and the person that they had licensed to had not done anything with it, had failed to get it to market. Right. And so it had reverted back to the university. And the day before I got there, they had relicensed it to a different person, but they split the license between three people and I had just missed out on it. And I was Aww. like, oh, what's the chances? You know, I thought, okay, well, that's, <laughs> if it's, it's not meant to be, you know, it's not meant to be. <laughs> and then I had this idea. It's like, I, 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 I was leaving the door and I, I said, wait, did you say you just licensed it yesterday? They said, yeah. So they haven't had time to do anything with it yet. Did, did, is this team, uh, have they have a team? Well, there's a couple of guys. It's like, can I get their number? I'd like to go and join them. Uh, right? That, that was my idea. Okay. 
you license it to them. I want to be in on this. So that's what I did. I tracked these guys down, right? I mean, yeah. I was not letting them get away. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, we, we talked on the phone and they weren't quite convinced and stuff. They want to look at my background and all this other stuff. And I was like, why don't we do this? I, I would meet with you. We can talk as much as we want, but I'm going to put in a sealed envelope what I would do with this technology. Okay. You're going to tell me what you're going to do with it. Okay. You'll sign a non-disclosure. Okay. If you like what's in my envelope, right better than what you're going to do i'm on the team equal partner <laughs> negotiation baby <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> let me guess so they, <laughs> yeah yeah so they ended up um so we ended up yeah they were kind of blown away they didn't fully understand the ramifications of what they had and the many usages. Just to give you an idea, they thought maybe they might do a, um, a private label shampoo and soap. <laughs> and they were thinking along the lines of some of the certain business models in the state of Utah that go via Oh yeah. Word of mouth. Yes. <laughs> the good old MLM baby. <laughs> I'm not against it, but this is what I told him. I said, I'm not against it. Okay. But here I, I'm not against it, but it only applies. It only really applies in certain cases. Let me give you an example. Tell me a product that's gone through that model that has reached 90% saturation in the market. Right. That has beat out their competitors and is 90%. Okay. Coca Cola has been able to do that. Okay. And there are markets where they have 90% penetration. Right. There's never been a product in MLM history that has ever done something like that. And this is worthy of that. Yeah. It's a moral imperative that if you want to kill a super germ or any kind of germ in the marketplace you cannot go down that method right 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 that's immoral if you've got something this good you have to go through every way possible to get it as cheap and drive down and all this stuff that's the way to go well they ended up agreeing and the other thing is that this was something that you could go through fda this was not just a nutraceutical this was hardcore and you'd have to go through it and they had never done that before right so I, I quite question how they even got the license for it but that's another story <laughs> altogether uh, competence is everything right <laughs> so i basically had figured out that i i did a graphic it's it, it is a poster that was about five feet long by two and a half feet wide. It was 16 point typeface. And I mapped out the, every product that this thing would go into. And it was about 80% of all products sold by Johnson and Johnson. Oh my goodness. Wow. 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 We're talking thousands of products, not, not shampoo and soap. That is the <laughs> yeah. one small bit. So the model that I showed them was easily, I'd say 600 times, not percent, times more valuable than what they were thinking. Wow. So um, we went after the equine market first. And I don't, I, I've been talking nonstop this whole time. We should get to some question and answer <laughs> section at some point. But Essentially, what um, this graph and this did was I mapped out what's the hardest FDA uh, hurdles you have to get to based on the product and its usage. What's the nearest, the lowest hanging fruit, the one you can get to the fastest and then work your way to the others. Um, and 
uh, basically, if you go through for this type of product, because people are worried about super bugs, so they're highly regulated. Right. And uh, if it's something that's underneath the kitchen sink and a child can get a hold of it or something, it's very, very regulated. Oh, yes. But where it's not regulated is with a veterinarian. Yes. And a veterinarian that's not, not treating uh, an edible animal like a cow or a chicken because those end up getting into your system. Yes. 70% of all drugs that is given to an animal will still be in there once they process the meat or the milk or whatever and you ingest it. And that's why superbugs grow because you're not just worried about vaccinating your population. You're vaccinating the entire edible food market. Right. Right. And you can't do that. And when you put that much uh, antimicrobial out there and you don't finish the entire regimen, you know, a doctor will give you something like a, you know, a, an antiviral or an antimicrobial or whatever. And they'll say, finish the whole thing. <laughs> and you feel good after you're about three quarters of the way through. And so you decide, I don't need to finish that. But you do, because what they're trying to do is kill it completely so it doesn't mutate. Right. And so when no one complies, that's how we, that's how these really bad superbugs come up is we, we don't kill them. Plus, uh, we're giving, uh, when you, when you take an antimicrobial, it's because you got sick or you got a cut and it's, there's an infection, but you don't do that to cattle because you get one of those guys get a microbe in them and it'll go through the herd because they're in oh. these close quarters, you know, they're in feedlots and everything. And it will go through the whole herd. And so you can't afford. So when you, when you feed it through their, through their, like, it's like a formula inside their drinking water, you are, you are treating the entire herd all at once. That is thousands of gallons of drugs that go through your edible edibles and end up in you. And um, so anyways, that's why I'm just giving you examples of why different types of of usages are more highly regulated than others. And in this one case, if a veterinarian is not treating an edible animal, but a cat or a dog or a thoroughbred, yes, they can do whatever they want. Got it. And so you can get FDA approval in that case. And so we started working with the top thoroughbred raisers in the world. Um, and that product is in market today. And wow. if the zombie apocalypse ever happens, <laughs> go and buy it from your local FFA store or whatever, <laughs> you know, those country stores that you see. It's the most powerful germ killer on the planet. It'll kill streptococcus, staph, wow. anything, just boom. I need some so, of that. There's a staph, there's a spray, <laughs> there's an injection. Just go bottle, buy a bottle of it. You're not allowed to market it that way, but it does uh, obviously work. You're an animal like they're an animal. FDA requires you to do a different formulation when you're marketing to humans than to that, and it takes a much longer uh, roadmap to go through FDA. But, but anyways, we were up and running in a matter of months with that. Wow. Then my uh, – boy, what am I doing? Okay, then I – then I invented a new camouflage technology with some partners who had been working on it and had some troubles with it. And I filed patent for a new camouflage technology for U.S. Special Forces. And yes. I went around and flew all over the country and trained these guys on how it works. Um, and uh, went through like a crowdfunding, you know, fundraising and stuff like that. And um, that was that was what I was doing up until the book that's going to be coming out is going to yes. talk about a project that happened yes. and in a roundabout way, I ended up being hired as the, one of the CEOs uh, over at Overstock. That's, and, so, and now I'm writing a book and, and designing a robot. Oh, I forgot about Jigabot. Oh, there's another yeah. a, a, Jigab- <laughs> a, a robot. Oh, geez. <laughs> I've basically done, Eight, eight startups, eight or nine, I guess, depending on how you maybe slice them. And those are the ones that I actually spent a lot of time. Not, I've, I've done others where I just simply advised or 
you know, maybe invested in something or whatever, um, like, um, like I even do right now, like I invested in the chosen and, you know, if you're watching that television series, the no way you, were, I had no idea. Bro. That's a great series. Yeah. A great series. Yeah. Yeah. What well, this is. So I see, this is the funny thing is as a friend, you see, your, we, we see, uh, sometimes on a surfacey level and, and just it's yo bro, what's up. And to hear this, I had no idea that you were at the forefront of 3D graphics. Had no idea. You probably worked with Ed Catmull and oh, those folks over at Pixar. And then uh, then I know you worked with Isabel DeFranc over there back in the day. This is the Warhols. She was a Warhol yeah. factory girl. And so all these different yeah. things. Matter of fact, I remember going into her front, front room and seeing a 15 foot original Warhol. <laughs> It was, that was yeah that was produced at that was produced at one of the places i did an internship for and wanted me to take over the business yeah. unreal unreal and so it just to hear all of these different things um first of all it's amazing because i see a, a depth that we never got into a, a whole lot of discussions but i think there's a there's a trajectory that is very apparent for anyone that's looking into getting into entrepreneurship and i'm just wondering because We've, we've been going for about an hour and 20 minutes. Would, would it be possible? Because we still haven't talked about your Jeep craziness. We haven't gotten into overstock and, and those, there's so many incredible things. And as usual, it's hotter than heck in Utah over there. But uh, <laughs> would it be possible fun. to be a part, uh, to do a part two to this? Because this is, I think in the next, uh, that phase up to the point that you got to overstock and now where you are now, it's I call it your walkabout man and I, I I'd like to learn a lot about your walkabout <laughs> I mean I could have talked an hour on each one of those there's awesome there's a, a, a lot of things that happened inside each of one of those eight eight going on nine various um yes. I call them projects at the time that would just turn into something but yeah okay um and they just they do some of them fall out of the sky and some of them are things that Again, I just keep a list of stuff, uh, and uh, right now on that list is, is a book and a new robot that I want to work on. Uh, <laughs> the other robot was Gigabot, and that one, best of show at CES, is the first product we ever put into CES by a team that I met out here that was involved in the film industry, but they had this technology I looked at and just like, what are you guys doing with that thing over there? You know, I'm... Uh, essentially with the idea because i didn't see it but they told me about it i was like why? and i told them this is what i would do with it right remember that envelope idea yeah Kinda like the same thing <laughs> like, i'm gonna give you guys an idea of what you should be doing with this and uh and they went and did a, a lot of uh luck visited with a lot of other investors and potential partners and they kind of came back to me after six months and said you know what you're the first person that told us exactly all these things. And once six months later, everyone else starts to come around to the same thing. We want you on board. <laughs> so that's, that's the way it, that one ended up. But that little robot is something that you know a lot about. We could probably go in greater detail yeah. for that one alone. It's very, it's athletics and all kinds of stuff. It's, yeah. it's, mostly in education right now and there's been some fumbling with getting it to market but it's amazing like that happens it is absolutely amazing well let's let's do that then if that's okay i know you're busy as a as a wild man there but let's let's do that and, and do a, another part two if that would be all right <laughs> and because this yeah you bet they need to hear the the stories. The audience, I, I know it will be fascinated with the stories and everything else that uh, that you've been through and we've been talking about in the last little bit there. So <laughs> let's do it again, yeah. all right? <laughs> I, I guess I, I guess I, I I don't talk very much about what I do. Um, I, in fact, sometimes I'm a very quiet person. <laughs> but you get me talking about something that I know about, and I will delve into the great depths of it for you. And one of the reasons why we probably could talk about Gigabot for sure and other things is there's a lot of technology about that 
that comes out in the announcement that Tesla just did oh, no way. several days ago about the, a- the, the AI robot that they're doing. Yeah. We developed some killer stuff in that regard. And I was just beaming with excitement when I heard, when I saw that presentation on, on AI day for Tesla. Uh, so that's, that's current events. Sure. I, I, I got I to I say, Kevin, uh, I am just fascinated. I've yeah. just been sitting here just absolutely fascinated because yeah. for one, just the, I call you like the pivot man. Like, <laughs> you, it's, just, it's just, it's so interesting to me. I mean, yeah, we, we definitely have to do more because I just, I'm just intrigued. I mean, I just okay. love hearing your journey. And I'm sure a lot of other people would like to hear it as well. It's just fascinating. Well, <laughs> then hopefully you'll love the book because that's I, I can't get into uh, all the details, just like in this conversation. There's just so much to tell. But that book goes through a, a real whirlwind of an experience that yeah. is beyond anything I've even shared right now. So uh, just a I personal love- journey of my own. Sure. Um, and really getting into, uh, yeah, just the core of who I am and what it is to be alive and what it is to have yeah. meaning in your life and and how do you come about that? And, and I think it's it's a message that's hungry in the world right now who have people that are just kind of, you know, not sure what, what they're doing with their lives or what's happening in the world or something like this. And I push all that aside and run like a bull into you know some of the most exciting adventures I can find, and I think more people should do that. Oh, I agree. I agree. I think we'll call the next session Jeeps and Gigabots. <laughs> 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 well, no, Kevin, thank you for the time. You. Fascinating stories. I've known you for so long, but there are so many things that I ha- you were so humble and never told me about that absolutely amazing so thank you and we will do it again shortly all right <laughs> you bet all right take care thank guys you. Thank you.